its ongoing impact together with associated backlogs, coupled with extraordinary levels of other illnesses this winter, is creating pressure that is truly unprecedented. Uh, and I want to just give uh, some more detail to illustrate all of that. Uh, firstly, in co on COVID, in the final week of 2022, uh, the ONS estimated that one in every 25 people in Scotland had COVID. Now, vaccines and treatments, thankfully, have very significantly reduced the health harm of COVID. But even so, more than 400 people with that virus were admitted to hospital just last week. In total, there are right now more than 1,200 patients with COVID in our hospitals. And for context, that is double the number four weeks ago. Now, even if, and this is absolutely the case, not all of them are in hospital directly or solely because of COVID, nevertheless, the fact that they have COVID means that enhanced infection control uh, procedures have to be in place, and that has an impact on hospital capacity. In addition to the ongoing impact of COVID, the NHS is, of course, dealing with backlogs of treatment built up in earlier stages of the pandemic. Now, it's important to say that progress is being made here. For example, over the autumn, more than 90% of operations were performed as planned, and the number of operations was a third higher than 12 months previously. So that's good progress, but the impact of backlogs remains significant. In addition to COVID, the country has been experiencing extraordinary levels of winter flu. More than 1,000 patients were admitted to hospital with flu during each of the last two weeks. And finally, there has also been a rising number of cases of strep A and other respiratory viruses resulting in a significant demand for services. So the impact of this combination of COVID, flu and strep A is clear in the statistics measuring demand for health services. If we look at the two four-day Christmas and New Year holiday periods, NHS 24 answered almost 100,000 calls. That's the highest number in more than a decade. In the final week of last year, compared uh, to the week before, calls to NHS 24 increased by around 50%. The impact on the ambulance service has also been significant, compounded by uh, longer turnaround times, which I'll come back to later. But the ambulance service responded to more than 16,000 emergency incidents in the past week, which is 11% higher than the average uh, over uh, the last four week period. Um, I want to stress at this point, though, the massive contribution that both NHS 24 and the ambulance service through new and innovative ways of working are making to preventing pressure on hospitals being even greater than it already is. Uh, additional NHS 24 staff were recruited in the run-up to Christmas and while call wait times were often longer than usual over the festive period because of the scale of demand, the overwhelming majority of calls received by NHS 24 were dealt with through that initial contact without the need for any further intervention such as a visit to hospital. Also, more than half of all patients seen by the ambulance service over the festive period were treated and discharged without needing to go to hospital at all. Now, to put that into context, before the pandemic, more than 60% of those who called the ambulance service would then be taken to hospital. The approach being implemented by the ambulance service called See and Treat is literally preventing hundreds of people every week having to go to hospital. Now, that's better for patients, uh, but it also helps reduce pressure on hospitals. And, of course, it is also testament to the expertise of the clinicians working in the ambulance service. Now, the impact of these initiatives shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, but despite them, the reality is hospitals right now are currently almost completely full. Uh, last Wednesday, hospital bed occupancy across Scotland exceeded at uh, 95%. Now, for context, at the same stage in 2020, before the pandemic struck, 
occupancy was around 87%. Now, that reflects three factors. First, the sheer scale of demand as a result of all of the things I've already mentioned. Uh, second, partly, in fact, as a result of initiatives like See and Treat, those who do require further care tend to be sicker with more complex needs. And third, delays in the discharge of patients who no longer need to be in hospital. Now, it's important to stress that the vast majority of people, somewhere around 96%, do leave hospital when they should. And while we have seen a slight reduction in delayed discharges in the most recent weeks, uh, there are, however, more than 1,700 people currently in hospital who don't need to be there and whose interests are not best served by being there because care packages that would allow them to be discharged home or to a care home are not in place. That obviously makes it harder to find beds for new patients who need to be admitted, and this creates pressure at the front end of the patient journey. And that pressure causes the longer waits in A&E that we've been seeing over recent times and longer turnaround times for ambulances, which in turn can mean longer ambulance response times. So in summary, while NHS staff continue to deliver excellent care, truly excellent care for thousands of patients each and every single day. In some key areas, the system is not currently providing patients with the speed of treatment that we want to see. Significant action to address this is already underway, in addition to important reforms like see and treat and hospital at home. For example, in October, an additional £600 million was provided specifically to augment health and social care capacity over the winter. This included funding to recruit up to 750 extra nurses, midwives and allied health professionals from overseas, as well as 250 support staff across acute primary care and mental health. Some of these staff are already in place and recruitment is ongoing. In addition, looking slightly further ahead, our draft budget for next year and the tax proposals in it mean that we will increase the health revenue uh, budget by more than £1 billion in the next financial year. And of course, we do hope that the prevalence of winter illnesses will abate in the weeks to come, reducing some of the pressure currently being experienced. However, all of that said, more does need to be done now. And the reason I've spent a bit of time today talking about both the scale and the nature of the current pressure is that it tells us where further action will have greatest impact. In short, to reduce the pressure in hospitals and the knock-on impacts at the front door, we need to do more, firstly, to avoid unnecessary attendances at hospital, and second, to speed up the discharge of patients from hospital. That is where our immediate focus is. The Health Secretary will provide uh, detail to Parliament in a statement tomorrow, but let me uh, highlight in summary form some areas of activity now. Uh, firstly, in relation to avoiding unnecessary hospital attendances, uh, I mentioned earlier that additional call handlers and clinicians were recruited to NHS 24 before the festive period. I can confirm that NHS 24 staffing will increase further in the coming weeks to further enhance its capacity to avoid it, to offer advice and care and so reduce the need for intervention by other parts of the NHS, including hospitals. NHS 24 will also be accelerating other strands of work planned for later this year, such as a new app and an extended range of self-help guides. Uh, primary care is, of course, already working under intense pressure. However, we're working to support health boards to maximise primary care capacity, including, for example, through the kind of initiative set out by NHS Lanarkshire last week to open GP practices on Saturdays. Uh, we'll also take further immediate steps to speed up discharge from hospitals. Uh, again, the Health Secretary will say more tomorrow, but I can confirm that we will be providing immediate extra funding to health and social care partnerships to support the booking of additional care home beds for patients to be discharged to while their care packages are being finalised. Uh, that will benefit patients. I think it's important to note that first and foremost, but it will also free up much needed capacity in hospitals. Uh, let me now 
just as I come to a conclusion, say a word about escalation contingencies uh, should these prove necessary uh, over the remainder of the winter. Uh, ministers do, of course, uh, have emergency powers and the ability to direct health boards that are set out in the NHS Scotland Act 1978. And we, of course, continue to keep the use of these under regular review. However, two points I think are important. First, any action we take must have tangible impact, which is why I have spent time today talking about the nature of the pressures and the targeted actions that we believe will have the biggest impact. What I think we should always avoid is simply putting different labels on the problem, such as critical incident, without being clear about the practical effect and impact of that. Second, while the NHS faces exceptional pressures across the whole country right now, it is important that NHS boards retain the ability to respond flexibly to local circumstances and deploy local solutions. So at this stage, our priority is to empower and support NHS boards. Again, the Health Secretary will say more tomorrow, but a letter of guidance will issue to boards this week, making clear that they can and should take steps to prioritise and protect critical and life-saving care if that is deemed necessary, accessing advice from government as required. Uh, these steps could include, for example, delivering a different model of care for a short period to prioritise critical and life-saving care, opening or procuring additional capacity and relocating staff to areas of greatest pressure. Now, the final points I want to make before opening uh, to your questions uh, are really for the wider public. Uh, firstly, I want to stress today that despite the pressures uh, that I have been talking about today that people are experiencing, the NHS is there for those who need it. But it's also important to say that for many people, the best advice and support uh, might be available on the NHS Inform website or the NHS 24 app or by calling NHS 24. So I would encourage people to make use of these services as many are already doing. Second, while it is without a shadow of doubt that it is the job of government to support the NHS to deliver care for all who need it, we learned, I think, during the COVID experience that all of us can play a part to help reduce pressure on the health service. I've already mentioned that COVID and flu are contributing significantly to current pressures. Uh, we can all help ourselves and also the NHS by taking reasonable precautions to reduce the risk of getting and spreading these viruses. Vaccination continues to be absolutely vital. So if you're eligible for a COVID or flu vaccine and haven't had it already, please do get vaccinated. And remember, if you're the parent or carer of a child who is eligible, please make sure they get vaccinated too. It's also worth remembering that many of the basic protections we stressed during the pandemic are still relevant now. Good hand hygiene, good ventilation, uh, for example. Uh, and anyone with symptoms of a respiratory infection, a cold, flu or COVID, should try to stay at home if at all possible and avoid contact with others. And if you do need to leave home, wear a face covering, uh, which fits well. Uh, more generally, we continue to advise uh, that those over the age of 12 should wear face coverings when on public transport or in public indoor spaces. That includes hospitals, GP surgeries and other healthcare facilities. By protecting our own health in these ways, we also do help uh, to protect the NHS. Now, we anticipated and planned for this winter to be difficult, but even so, current pressures are exceptional and severe. Uh, so once again, my thanks go to the entire health and care workforce. And I can assure everyone that government is resolutely focused on supporting the NHS through these challenges. I chaired a meeting of our cross-government resilience committee on Friday. I will do so again this Friday and weekly for the foreseeable future. Uh, there are no easy solutions given the nature and scale of the challenges faced right now. But by enabling more people to get support and treatment out of hospital, by ensuring that care is in place for people able to leave hospital, we can make an impact in relieving some of the pressures our hospitals are facing. And we can ensure that as we move through winter and into spring, the NHS can continue its recovery from the pandemic and provide patients with the support and treatment they need. Uh, with those comments, uh, we will now open up to questions. I'm going to take uh, 
question from everybody who has indicated uh, that they have one and the Deputy Chief Medical Officer and the Health Secretary uh, will help me answer these. Uh, so with thanks for your patience uh, at the moment, can I firstly go to Ewan Petrie from STV. Thank you, First Minister. <coughs> Do you agree with the BMA's assessment that Scotland's hospitals are not safe for patients given the pressures that you've just outlined there and that patient safety is now at risk every day? I'm going to hand over in a second to the Deputy Chief Medical Officer Graham Ellis uh, to give a clinical perspective on, on that question. Can I say, first of all, uh, I absolutely understand, and I hope this has come across from what I say today, the uh, concerns and the anxieties of clinicians and the staff who support them working in our NHS every day. It is uh, a statement of the obvious that working with the scale of pressures uh, that are being experienced right now is an incredibly difficult task. So um, I uh, will never, ever uh, criticise any healthcare professional or any organisation representing them for speaking up in the way that they think is appropriate about the, the nature of the pressures being faced. But I do think it's also important for me to stress, and this is the experience of you know, literally thousands of patients, the vast majority of patients each and every day in our health service who get excellent care. Uh, the NHS is there safely uh, for those who need it. We are experiencing challenges right now that mean that more patients than we want to be the case are waiting longer than we want to be the case for their treatment. And that, of course, does raise uh, concerns um, about clinical care. Uh, but patients in our NHS get an excellent standard of care, and that is down to the dedication of those healthcare professionals who are doing such a good but incredibly difficult job at this time. Um, I'll hand over to Graham uh, to maybe give us a clinical perspective on that, and uh, the Health Secretary may want to add a word or two as well. Yeah, thank you, First Minister. Uh, along with the Chief Medical Officer and other Deputy Chief Medical Officers, we've been visiting emergency departments and GP practices. So we've seen firsthand the exceptional care that our colleagues provide under extraordinary circumstances. And I'm very proud of what they do, but we are very acutely aware of the challenges they face day and daily. And we've been working with clinical colleagues to look at how we can help and support them. We, we do think hospital is a safe place if you need emergency care, but we uh, would stress that actually once, once you're medically stable, that the better alternative is to be back home in the community and going to work on improving discharges from hospital but also finding alternatives to hospital admission, whether it's for an acute condition through hospital at home, OPAT, community respiratory teams, or through alternative sources of help if you need it. So we do uh, recognise that there are concerns voiced by clinicians, we're speaking to them regularly, but we do think hospital care needs to be prioritised for those most acutely ill and remains the safest place if you need it. Um, I'll Take Lisa Summers just in the interest of keeping moving through the questions, then I'll bring uh, the Health Secretary in in response to that. Uh, Lisa Summers from the BBC. Yeah, I guess my question slightly broader on that. You know, we've got a situation where people are struggling to get an ambulance, where people are sitting for hours in an A&E in a critical condition, where doctors are saying the system is collapsing. You yourself just described it as the pressures being exceptional and severe. That does sound like the sort of emergency situation that, that, that led to the NHS being put into emergency measures at the start of COVID. So why not now? Why do it differently? And have we not come to a point, given you've said these pressures existed before COVID, that we should maybe be honest with the, with the public, or you as politicians should be honest with the public, that the NHS is unsustainable in its current form and we need to radically rethink how the NHS operates? Um, no, I, I don't believe the NHS is unsustainable in its current form. I believe the NHS, uh, in line with advances in the way healthcare is, is delivered, advances in technology and the availability of drugs, in the fact that we have a, a population that is living longer, a, a thoroughly good thing, the NHS needs to adapt and change and reform. Um, but the, the model of the NHS uh, of delivering care free at the point of need is one that I am 100% committed to, and I think the public are to uh, reference very briefly in my opening remarks the difficult decisions we are taking for the budget next year to ask those who can afford to to pay slightly more in income tax so that we can further increase uh, the funding going to the National Health Service. Um, I'll hand over to the Health Secretary in a second but just a couple of points. Ambulance, the ambulance service is working as I, I said under intense pressure uh, but if we look at the, the most these are figures up to uh, the first of 
January, uh, the most serious, uh, urgent calls, the median uh, response time of the ambulance service was 7 minutes 44 uh, seconds. Uh, for the category below that median uh, response time, 10 minutes 7 seconds. So the ambulance service is responding to thousands of calls uh, every week and responding very quickly. There is an issue, apart from general pressure on the ambulance service, uh, reflecting the pressure across the whole system, there is a particular issue that I have spoken about already, about ambulances taking too long at hospitals to, uh, when they bring patients to hospital, for those patients to be admitted into hospital. And that is the, the pressure at the front door, reflective of the pressures further into hospitals. That is what we are trying to address. Uh, and finally, on this issue, which again I, I sought to um, refer to in my opening statements about emergency powers. Um, we've got to be very clear that if we put a label on something, we know what that means and what changes it will make. When we used emergency powers at the start of COVID, that was effectively to cancel all elective treatments, to prioritise uh, urgent and immediate healthcare needs. Now, when you do that, the people who need that elective treatment don't suddenly not need it anymore. So what you do is continue to create uh, or exacerbate a backlog of care and people who need elective care are waiting longer for that. So that is something that any government has to think very carefully about. And I don't think it would be the appropriate thing to do right now. It is right to give health boards the power and the flexibility in local circumstances, as I said, to perhaps pause some treatments for short periods to prioritise life-saving care. But we need to support the health service uh, through this period uh, while trying to treat people um, as fully as we possibly can. And again, you know, I, I spent a bit of time today, you know, a fair bit of time, talking about the particular nature of the pressures right now. And that is because we need to be very targeted in some of our responses to give ourselves the best ability to support staff in relieving some of these pressures. Um, so there's no easy solutions here, uh, but there is a lot of tough work that needs to be done to support those at the front line. I'll hand over now to uh, Hamza. Thanks, First Minister. There's little for me to add. You've covered it uh, as expected. I would say in the ambulance service, worth mentioning uh, in relation to the statistics that the First Minister uh, relayed, that, that is in the context of emergency calls being 10% higher than they were in the four weeks prior, and yet still being able to manage those uh, response times, uh, particularly for immediately immediate life-threatening uh, calls. The First Minister is right, uh, Lisa, you referenced in your question that emergency footing pre-pandemic, the reason why we're reluctant to go there uh, is because uh, taking steps such as a blanket cancellation of elective procedures, pausing or stopping key diagnostic tests, well, they're not benign acts. They have an impact, they have an effect. Uh, and in fact, many people, many clinicians that I've spoke to in A&E departments up and down the country tell me that a number of people they're seeing uh, are of higher acuity because they've deteriorated and deconditioned because they've not received the elective care necessarily uh, that they've received. Uh, what I will say, and, and the First Minister mentioned this in her uh, remarks, is the guidance that I've issued may, has made it really clear that we expect local health boards to have those conversations with clinicians. There's no in-principle objection from the government that if they determine that a critical incident should be called at a local health board level and it's going to have practical impact as a result of calling that a critical incident, then they should do that. There's no in principle objection from the government, but it should be a local health board discussion between the management uh, and, and uh, clinicians uh, on the ground. In terms of honesty, I think I've done that in multiple and we've done that in multiple interviews uh, about the scale of the challenge that the NHS is facing. It's why our recovery plan, for example, is a recovery plan for the course of this parliamentary term. It's not a, a recovery plan that suggests everything in the NHS will be fine after a few months or uh, even, a, even a few weeks. So we'll continue uh, with that honesty in our future discussions on the NHS. Uh, Conor Gillis from Sky. Thanks. Uh, just focusing back on, on GPs for a second, First Minister, uh, you were acknowledging there that the model that's being adopted in Lanarkshire to open on Saturdays, um, some people would suggest that this is not happening fast enough um, because the reality for many people is that they simply cannot get a GP's appointment at the moment. You know, take, for example, a family. Uh, I've spoken to Sky News. Uh, uh, their dad took a dizzy turn at work, phoned NHS 24. 
couldn't get a GP uh, to speak to on the phone uh, and their family were told that it wasn't a life-threatening uh, situation and they listened to that public health advice not to turn up at accident and emergency and put that additional pressure on that you're talking about. And he died two days later. This was around the Christmas period. So this is happening on your watch. So how quickly will this happen in terms of opening at weekends to get people through the system? These are principally local health board decisions about how they think the uh, use of resources best meets the, the needs that they are uh, that they are experiencing. I think the NHS Lanarkshire um, initiative is a good one, um, and we are looking to support health boards uh, who want to do that and who feel that would make a contribution to what they're dealing with to do that as quickly as possible. But what we're dealing with here, and it, it goes back to some of what I said earlier on, because... Uh, you know, the, obviously the experience that you've recounted to, to me there, nobody wants to, to see happen. Um, but this is about making sure people get uh, the most appropriate care at the, the place that is, you know, quick enough and the right place. So NHS, one of the reasons we are continuing to increase NHS 24 staffing is because often for uh, many people, uh, that will be the advice that they need. And NHS 24 call handlers and the clinicians in NHS 24 who support them can then make uh, clinical uh, judgments about whether somebody needs to see another healthcare professional or not. So it's about making sure uh, not just that one part of the system uh, is working as we want it to, but the, the whole system and the interactions between these different parts uh, are operating as well. Um, and that is work that is very much ongoing and always is, even outside these exceptional periods uh, of pressure that we're dealing with right now. Uh, I don't know, Graeme, if you want to say, give a, a clinical perspective on the NHS 24 uh, process that will then uh, guide a patient as to whether or not they need further clinical intervention. Yeah, and um, I'm sorry to hear about that case. I don't know the details, but obviously my sympathy is with the family. I have visited GP practice and seen that they are working exceptionally hard. And it's worth stating that the recent Group A stre uh, uh, crisis created extraordinary pressures for GPs. But I think relating to a previous question, whilst we are looking at ways of addressing current demand, the way in which we deliver care is likely to change, and I think that's something that people can expect. We are widening out the multidisciplinary team within the GP practices, so you may see someone other than a doctor. But through NHS 24, we are looking at creating more of an accessible service for people that might be able to hear and deal with their needs and direct them to alternatives to care. So they are changing the way in which they deliver and respond to, to people's needs. And I think we can expect more of that in, in time to come. So I think that is part of our necessary response to the current unprecedented demand. Louise Scott from ITV. Thank you, First Minister. Um, can I ask about the social care side of things? You're obviously talking about delayed discharges, um, 1,700 people in hospital um, that don't need to be there. I'm presuming the majority of them are waiting on social care packages or go back to that setting. You're talking about changes that you're making now and extra funding now. Why is this only happening now when the warnings were in place from the summer, when 600 million was put into social care in October? Where did that money go? Why is more capacity not being created since then? And how much extra capacity are you thinking is going to be created in the coming weeks and months from this um, announcement today? Uh, I'll hand over Tom's in a second, uh, but this has not just been done now, and more capacity has been created. Hamza can go into uh, more detail around this, but if we look at uh, recent weeks, the number of delayed discharges has actually uh, decreased um, at a time when you know, we might otherwise, given the pressures, have expected to see an increase in delayed discharges. So the previous investment and uh, what that has enabled us to secure has already been making an impact. Um, but there is still much more we need to do. Uh, of the 1,700 I spoke about, um, a few hundred of those will be people with extremely complex needs and, and people for whom the Adults with Incapacity Act is also in place. So these are, are much more uh, difficult. But we believe that we can do more to speed up discharge in the interest of patients, but also to free up capacity in hospitals. In terms of the scale of this, we want to secure as many care home beds uh, as we possibly can to provide effectively interim care. So instead of somebody uh, waiting for a care package being in hospital while that care package has been put in place, they can be discharged from hospital for a short period to a care home uh, while the 
uh, more long-term care package is put in place. Uh, so we will seek to uh, access as many care home beds as possible, and there are discussions across the country ongoing right now about that, um, and we will uh, devote as much funding as necessary uh, to maximise uh, that capacity. And, of course, uh, the Health Secretary will update Parliament in more detail tomorrow. But do you want to say a bit yeah. more about the work that's been done so far to reduce delayed discharges? Yeah, just to reiterate, this has been going on uh, for many, many months. In fact, uh, I announced some measures uh, last October to help with the winter pressures then, uh, and that much of that funding was recurring. Uh, £124 million uh, pounds out of that winter, £600 million pounds that you mentioned. Uh, Louise is specifically for additional capacity for care at home or indeed uh, care home uh, placements. On top of that, we're trying to deal with what is the number one issue that I hear from social care providers up and down the country, workforce, workforce, workforce. And it's why uh, we've increased uh, the wage uplift for adult social care workers. And in the most recent budget announcement by the Deputy First Minister, uh, a further wage increase uh, will follow uh, at the beginning of the next financial uh, year. Fair to say that social care is not immune to not just the pressures of Brexit and the pandemic, uh, or indeed uh, the cost crisis, but where we have flu outbreaks and outbreaks of COVID, that has also impacted the ability uh, to admit uh, uh, people into, into care homes. In fact, as a personal anecdote, uh, I know the uh, care home where I have a family member has had to put in some further restrictions because of an outbreak uh, over uh, the festive period. And that's happening in care homes uh, up and down uh, the country. It's fair to say also that the, the 17 or more than 1,700 people who are delayed uh, discharges, they're not a static number, as the First Minister mentioned uh, in her comments, above that more than 95%, 96% of people uh, are being discharged on time, so we're having continual discharge, but of course we're getting people coming in the front door. It's why the, you know, the strategy here is a whole systems approach, try to reduce the number of people coming at the front door as best we can through NHS 24 and so on and so forth, and also discharge out the back door as quickly as we possibly can. I'll lay out some additional measures and the detail of that uh, to Parliament tomorrow. Uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, First Minister, uh, Dumfries and Galloway Health and Social Care Partnership have in the last couple of days spoken about pressures greater than during uh, the COVID uh, crisis, difficult day-to-day -day decisions, accelerating discharges. NHS Borders have talked about extreme pressure. Borders General Hospital remains at capacity and they've also paused all routine operations. They've done that. You've said you don't want hospitals to do that, but they've done that. What more can you and the Scottish Government do to help both of those? Firstly, just in, in point of fact, Peter, I said that we wanted to empower local health boards to take local decisions that they thought were appropriate. What we do not think is uh, appropriate or uh, sensible at the moment is a nationwide uh, pause on elective uh, procedures, although we keep all of that under review. What, what you've described there uh, as the experience in Dumfries and Galloway and Borders uh, is the experience of many health boards uh, right now. The, uh, I think it was Dumfries and Galloway you quoted there as saying uh, pressures uh, more severe than during COVID. In many ways, that will be the how it feels and how it is for uh, those on the front line of our health service right now. Uh, because in the early days of COVID, of course, we did pause elective treatment as well as the ongoing impact of COVID right now. We have the pressures of the backlog and also flu and other respiratory viruses that, remember, were by and large suppressed by COVID uh, restrictions in the same way that COVID was uh, suppressed. So this combination of factors will absolutely be making the experience of those on the front line of our health service feel much more challenging even uh, than at stages during the pandemic. I come back to what I said earlier on. Uh, there, there is a need at the front end of our hospitals as far as possible, while stressing that people who need to turn up at A&E and people who need to be in hospital should do that and should be there, ensuring that there are other options for the patients who do not need to be at A&E, which is why uh, what I've spoken about in summary today, about NHS 24, about the ongoing work to support primary care, including as part of that GP practices is important, but then at the other end, uh, making sure that people who do not clinically need to be in hospital have the uh, care and support packages to be at home or in care homes. Uh, so this is bringing to this, as we have been doing, but as we will continue to do, a targeted approach based on where these serious blockages in the system uh, are. Um, and that, 
you know, is not easy for any health board dealing with it right now. But that is the right support for government to seek to bring to bear and support health boards to take the local actions that they think are necessary. Uh, Alan Jenkins from uh, Five News. First Minister, you mentioned the context of these pressures, COVID, the flu, strep A. But do you accept that your handling of the NHS has contributed to this as well? And to the Health Secretary, are you out of your debt dealing with this crisis? Um, first, well, I'll answer for Hamza. Hamza is uh, a Health Secretary doing uh, a very good job uh, in very difficult circumstances. I spent uh, six years uh, doing, almost six years, doing the job that Hamza is doing now. Um, I know that in times that then were relatively easy compared to uh, what has been experienced right now, being health secretary is possibly the toughest job uh, in government. Um, and, you know, Hamza is doing it well. In terms of our handling of, of the health service and our management of the health service, other people will be the judge of that. All I know is that we are facing exceptional pressures that are not unique to Scotland. Um, I'm only here today to talk about the NHS in Scotland, but... Health services everywhere are dealing with these pressures. I think in many respects, uh, in a relative sense, and I stress only in a relative sense, NHS Scotland is dealing with some of these pressures uh, in a, a better way than we would see elsewhere, and some of the statistics bear that out. But that is of less importance than the experience of patients in Scotland right now. Um, I uh, will every single day, and I think people saw this from me and my government during COVID, uh, will to the very best of her ability support the health service through these difficult times. And beyond that, uh, support the health service uh, to recover fully from COVID and to make the changes and reforms to uh, patient pathways, methods of care that are necessary to deal with the changes that we've been talking about previously in our discussions. Um, Hamza, I'll hand over to you briefly. Yeah, thanks. And look, I've been in government for the best part of 10 years in various different roles. And this is by far the most challenging at the most challenging time. But I think the First Minister is absolutely correct that if somehow Scotland was unique as the only part of the United Kingdom facing these challenges, facing these pressures and other health services right across the United Kingdom, Kingdom or indeed, frankly, across Europe and across the world were somehow performing much better in dealing with these challenges without uh, any, any problems whatsoever, then, of course, uh, I, I think your question would be uh, fairly legitimate. But they're not. Of course, even with these pressures, Scotland still continues to perform, have the best performing a &E departments, for example, uh, than anywhere else in the rest uh, of the UK. So I'll keep doing that job. I'm working uh, relentlessly, leaving no stone unturned to make sure I'm providing as much support as I possibly can to the health service, whether that's helping the workforce and Again, I would just mention the point that uh, so far, of course, uh, before the festive period, where other parts of the United Kingdom were dealing with uh, strikes from nurses and ambulance services, uh, we managed to avoid it. That was because myself and, uh, of course, the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, were deeply engaged uh, with the workforce, uh, with trade unions, uh, and trying to support the NHS. So I'll continue to do that uh, every waking moment that I possibly can. Uh, James Cook. First Minister, thanks very much. That's all very well, but patients are dying in trolleys. People are dying because ambulances aren't getting to them. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine estimates that 40 additional deaths are happening every week because of the pressures on the NHS. So I'd like to ask Professor Ellis if he recognises that figure and if not, what the government figure is. And I'd like to ask the First Minister, just taking a step back, did this country and did the NHS generally not go into COVID, let alone now, with not enough staff, not enough social care beds, and also, crucially, critical care beds per head of population among the lowest in the developed world? And isn't that ultimately the responsibility of the government that you've been involved with for 15 years? Well, well firstly... Everything that happens in the Scottish Government is ultimately my responsibility. I, I think people can criticise me and, and should and do. Uh, I don't think they would fairly criticise uh, me for not stepping up and taking responsibility. That's the nature of my job, but it's not something I should get any particular credit for. So all of these things uh, are my responsibility, and uh, I, I will never shy away from that. In terms of, uh, and you know, I, I say this for context, I'm going to come on to the actions uh, of my government uh, we, because of the nature of the devolved 
uh, governance of Scotland and the way our budgets are set, there are hard limits on what we can invest overall in public services and within that in the National Health Service. Um, but taking account of that, we have seen an NHS budget that has increased substantially uh, over the years uh, of uh, my party being in government. And we have also taken decisions. Uh, we are in the process of taking another decision right now. Uh, difficult decisions to ask people to pay more in income tax so that we can devote more resources to the National Health Service. So within the powers we have, we are have been and will continue to maximise the resources that can go to the National Health Service. Um, on staffing, there are, and uh, this is an approximate figure, we can get you the precise figure uh, later on, there are more than 20,000 additional people working in the NHS today compared to at uh, the point at which uh, my party came to government. We are facing uh, very, very severe uh, staffing constraints, not just in the health service, but across the public services and across society generally right now that have been significantly, and there's no getting away from this, significantly exacerbated by the ending of freedom of movement uh, as part of Brexit. So it is much harder to recruit staff into the National Health Service. In terms of beds in the National Health Service, and again, going back to my experience as Health Secretary, uh, we have, and across the developed world, this has been the case. As uh, length of stay in hospital for some uh, procedures, cataracts, for example, I vividly remember more than 20 years ago now, my gran being in hospital for cataracts. She was in hospital for several days. You're now in and out of hospital for cataract treatments in a morning. So the number of beds in our hospitals uh, have changed to reflect changing patterns uh, of care. As we move forward, we need to take account of, of all of that. Now, before I hand over to Graham, because you asked him a, a specific question, um, I, the, the pressures that our NHS is facing right now mean, notwithstanding the fact that the vast majority of people get an excellent standard of care in our health service, and it's really important not to lose sight of that, but the delays in accident and emergency, uh, for example, um, are meaning that too many people are waiting longer than they should be for care. And it would be wrong for me to say that that does not have any clinical impact uh, on these patients. But it would equally be wrong as me as First Minister, and this would be a dereliction of duty, to stand here and simply talk about the problem or to suggest that there are easy uh, solutions to the, the problem. What we are seeking to do, uh, and what I've tried to set out today, is understand at a granular level exactly where the pressures are how those pressures are being created and therefore how we better uh, bring resources and interventions to bear to deal with those problems. That's the, the job of government and you know, dealing uh, with the, uh, the questions, the concerns, the anxieties of staff and patients while we do that is, is also uh, a part of the, the job of government. This is uh, a really tough time. I've been in government for the entirety of the time my party's been in government. This is, and as I've said a couple of times already, spent uh, quite a significant chunk of that as health secretary um, during difficult times. This is beyond anything we have experienced before because of that combination of factors. So we need to deal with that. We need to learn from that as we take the decisions for the future of the National Health Service. And that is what we are seeking to do every single day. Graham, do you want to address the point? Yeah, I think delays matter and delays have consequences. There's no denying that. And I think we recognise that, but I do think we need to modernise care. What we need is not more of the same, and I think First Minister's outlined that. We need to find better and safer ways of delivering care going forward. We need to tackle a shift towards prevention, and we need to tackle inequalities across Scotland. And I think that has to be part of any modern health service coming out of this. And we are currently working with boards to uh, do what we can to make care safer. There's no question that we're absolutely uh, engaging with them on that question. I'm so sorry, that question is the figure. Yeah. So I don't know the Scottish figure. I'm aware that the Royal College of Emergency Medicine in England have put a similar figure out there. I do think that they are right in saying that there is a consequence to delays in emergency access to care. That is why it's so important that we find alternatives to care for those who don't need emergency care and we find routes out of emergency care for those who are safe to be moved on. We're absolutely tackling that, yeah. Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. Um, we heard, obviously, about strike action and what's been done to avert strike action with the, the pay negotiations. But the threat of strike action still 
remains. We know the RCN and the GMB are planning it with going ahead with strike action, not just about pay, but it's about the conditions that staff are facing. And we've heard throughout this crisis just about how devastating all of this has been for staff across the health service. So what further action has been taken? What talks do you have planned with those unions to avert this strike action? Well, it's an important question and we are doing everything and will continue to do absolutely everything we can to avert industrial action in the National Health Service. Today, we are the only part of the UK that has averted industrial action. That has not been easy. Uh, the pay offer that has been made to NHS staff and um, accepted by uh, a number of trade unions um, and trade unions, I think, representing probably the majority, if not the majority, then almost the majority of health service workers, is significantly better than the pay offer uh, on the table elsewhere in the UK, 7.5% uh, on average compared to 4.5% in other parts of the UK. So it's important to, to recognise uh, the efforts that have already been made, meaning that we've not seen the industrial action uh, that other parts of the UK has. As you said, though, uh, the RCN and the GMB, in particular some smaller unions as well, have not accepted that uh, or have, did not vote to accept that. So discussions are, are ongoing. We can, we were very clear, we maximised within the resources we have this year uh, what we were able to to, to offer in the way of pay increases this year. But we continue to have discussions to see uh, what we can do to avert industrial action, which is in nobody's interest. I have had discussions over the festive period to that end. The Health Secretary has had discussions. We will have more uh, discussions over the course of this week. Um, our health service uh, staff and our social care staff deserve the highest possible increase that we can give them. Um, and that's what we are seeking to to do, uh, but we have finite resources, and we've rehearsed the, the the reasons for that many, many times. So I won't go into that today. We have finite resources, and that is something I cannot change standing here. But what I can absolutely give an assurance of is that we will continue to do everything we can uh, to avert industrial action by making sure that we are rewarding our healthcare staff uh, to the fullest possible extent. Uh, Gina Davidson from Global. Thanks, First Minister. Um, you mentioned that there will be more uh, staff for NHS 24 in the coming weeks. Can you say how many and also this immediate extra funding for care home beds? How much will that funding be and where will it come from, given that your finance secretary is saying that they're struggling to balance the books this year? Well, the second, first part of the second uh, question I think I've already indicated uh, we will fund as many care home beds as we can access obviously I'm not going to say today exactly how much that is because we are still uh, trying to uh, assess how many care home beds we can access the funding for that will come from within existing resources but of course it makes sense to try to target resources as far as we can uh, to where we can make the biggest impact in alleviating pressures because these pressures first and foremost uh, they are impacting on patients uh, but dealing with pressures like that also you know has an impact on NHS resources so the more we can use resources to mitigate these pressures, uh, the better. Uh, in terms of what I've said about NHS 24, I did preface all of my comments by saying the Health Secretary will give more detail tomorrow to Parliament, so I'm not going to go into any more of the detail of that uh, today, but uh, the Health Secretary will set out more unless he wants to say any more right now uh, to Parliament in a statement tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, no, it's appropriate that I update Parliament, obviously, with the, the, the detail, but uh, fair to say that we've already increased the clinical staff in NHS 24, and both the call handlers, of course, are important, and so are the clinical staff, and the clinical staff being on hand, of course, helps us to hopefully give reassurance to those on the other end of the phone to stop them and prevent them from having to go any, to, to A&E uh, or indeed uh, busy uh, acute sites. So we've increased uh, the clinical staffing uh, over the course of the last year and actually increased staffing overall uh, in relation to the, 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 the festive period where we, know, where we knew we'd have uh, significant uh, demand. But uh, as I say, I'll lay out more detail uh, to the Scottish Parliament uh, as appropriate tomorrow. Uh, Neil Purin from PA. Thanks, First Minister. Again, on delayed discharges, could some patients end up being discharged back to their homes, even if they don't have social care packages in place, as has been suggested for the NHS in Wales? Um, these are uh, ultimately uh, clinical decisions, and uh, Graham is very involved with hospital at home uh, and is a geriatrician, so I'll ask him to uh, give a clinical perspective. It's important that the safety uh, and well-being of patients is paramount uh, but it will often 
uh, for very many reasons, uh, be in the interest of a patient to be at home rather than in hospital. Being in hospital for any individual who doesn't clinically need to be there is not a good thing. Um, and for older people in particular, it can compound uh, some of the, the issues that they're already dealing with. But I'll hand over to Graham, who will be able to say uh, more from a clinical perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Home is the safest place to be if you're well enough to be home. Obviously, if the situation at home isn't safe, that isn't a situation that you would dictate. It's an individual case-by-case -case decision made by a multidisciplinary team in a hospital setting based on that individual's needs and available support and care for them. So there's no way in which we can, at this point, uh, dictate for a country. But I think that uh, increasingly people will be having to have conversations one-to-one -one with individual patients and families to look at what's best for them. Uh, Helen Puttock from the Times. And it seems to me that anyone who's watched the NHS closely over recent times, all the figures you put out yourself on delayed discharge and A&E waiting times, plus the stage we were with the pandemic and the ageing population, would have entirely predicted the situation we'd see this winter. I mean, winters before um, COVID came along were quite often like this in January. So do you accept that it was foreseeable? Will you review whether your plans were adequate? And, or do you think that actually the stage we're at in terms of staffing in the NHS and, and viruses circulating the ageing population means this is how it is going to be for the next few years? Um, well, if, if you did foresee everything over the last couple of years, uh, well done. I should probably have a, a word with you uh, later on. Look, we review this, these, these, these things all of the time as any responsible government should. Uh, we look critically at what we have got right in our planning. We look just as critically, if not more critically, at what we uh, didn't get right or what we should have got better. That is an ongoing process and it is particularly important given uh, the times we have been living through. Uh, we're seeing, even by the standards of normal winters, flu that is uh, at exceptional levels. We did anticipate um, a, a higher level of flu this winter uh, than in recent years, not, not least because it has been suppressed over COVID by the same restrictions that have suppressed COVID. But even uh, by the standard of what was expected, what we are dealing with right now is exceptional. And add into that the uh, strep A and, and other respiratory viruses. COVID continues uh, to pose uh, a real challenge, even although the, the vaccines have reduced the, the health harm of it. Um, and we monitor uh, developments in COVID all of the time as well. Um, and to go to your question, is this how it is always going to be? No, I hope it's not. Uh, we uh, do look ahead and try to predict uh, trends in the health service. That's why we're constantly increasing staffing numbers and the funding going to our health service, reforming models and, and pathways of, of care. But what I would say is that the path of COVID over the next couple of years remains uncertain. You know, we're monitoring closely the XBB uh, 1.5 uh, subvariant of Omicron uh, right now, which uh, the early indications are is more transmissible than what has come before. So that is going to continue to challenge us. Uh, so where I think your your question is 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 probing us in the right way is we've got to be very responsive to that. We cannot simply do things in the health service the way they've always been done, while the nature and variety of challenges that we're facing it remains as volatile and as unpredictable, to some extent unpredictable, as we've seen over the past two or three years. Not had it. Yeah, well, I wondered if I could add something on, on the ageing population and just maybe a bit of care about our language about older people. But um, the question about whether this would have been predictable, in fact, I don't know if this would surprise you, but prior to the pandemic, the, the, the number of those who were in care was falling as a proportion prior to the pandemic, despite the ageing of the population, and the number of long hours of home care was also falling prior to the pandemic. So I think that the, the, a modern health service would look at creating healthy ageing and not assume an inevitability that all we require is more beds and more care. So I think that's a more modern solution to the problem. Thanks. Uh, Joseph Anderson from The Scotsman. Uh, thank you, First Minister. As mentioned previously, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine Scotland said there's been 50 excess deaths a week. Given how long you've been in charge of NHS Scotland, given how long we've known about these coming demographic changes and how hard the coming winter is going to be, will you take responsibility for those excess deaths? And what would you say to the families of those affected who are watching right now? Well, I, 
have very often and will readily say again, I, you know, I'm very sorry to anybody who doesn't get the speed of care or the quality of care in the NHS that all of us want to see them get. The vast majority of people do get speedy, very high quality care. Um, and to go back to, to your question, I, I think I said in response to um, somebody else, I can't remember who, forgive me, um, James, I think, I, I take responsibility for everything uh, that... Uh, happens that is the responsibility of the Scottish Government. That's in the nature of my job. Uh, Paul Hutchin from the Daily Record. Hi, thank you. Um, just to go back to social care and recruitment, um, if you look at the uh, NHS recovery plan update, I think it said that uh, the hourly rate had been increased to £10.50 an hour for social care staff. Now, by any yardstick, that's still very low pay. Is it any wonder there is a social care recruitment crisis when people are expected to do a very difficult, demanding job for such a low wage? We're seeking to increase the uh, pay of those in social care. There were over uh, recent year, I think, two increases in one year. Do we want to go further than that? Yes. Uh, we've got to do that in a way that our overall budget can uh, sustain and uh, and be affordable within. Um, but there's no doubt, and in fact, one of the, not the only, but one of the reasons behind our uh, plans for reform of social care and the creation of a national care service is to have uh, national terms and conditions and uh, better pay and reward, you know, collective bargaining across social care. It's one of the most, and the pandemic told us this, it's one of the most important jobs we ask anybody to do in our country. Traditionally, and I mean going back decades, it has not been, in my view, valued as much as it should have been, perhaps reflective of uh, many uh, professions and jobs that are predominantly female. Um, and that's something we are changing and need to continue to change. So that is very much work in progress. Hamza, do you want to add? Yeah, again, just to reiterate, when I first came into this post, uh, the, 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 the uh, wage was £10.02 uh, for adult social care uh, workers, increased it. Uh, sorry, below that actually, increased it to £10.02, increased it to £10.50, and of course we're now going to increase it to £10.90. Uh, uh, what I would say also on top of that is just the point the First Minister's made, it's entirely uh, one of the reasons, of, well, one of the reasons uh, driving the National uh, Care Service. Fair work principles are at the heart of that, you can see that in the National Care Service bill, sectoral bargaining, terms and conditions, standardised uh, across the country will no doubt help with those uh, workforce uh, issues, but what I will say absolutely is that we're not waiting for the National Care Service to come into place. We're taking action now to try to improve uh, terms, conditions uh, and, and of course uh, a wage uplift uh, uh, as, as I've already outlined. I would say that one of the other big, big challenges, significant challenges that social care uh, is facing alongside workforce is those really high energy and high inflation uh, costs. Now we'll do what we can to support from a Scottish Government perspective, from a health and social care portfolio, uh, but clearly that's where a lot of my conversation with the UK Government Centre around is what we can do to, to reduce some of the burden uh, on social care providers up and down the country in relation to high energy costs. Uh, can you, Manyanda from the Financial Times. Uh, th thank you, First Minister. And someone, Gina and Paul, have actually sort of covered most of my question was also around about primary care and and speeding up discharge. Suppose maybe I, could, maybe I could just add in then and ask, like, how quickly c can you get results from these actions that you announced today, considering where we are today? I mean, uh, are we hoping to get capacity now? Are we talking about future? Uh, what, what, what difference can this make now in, in, in the crisis as, as where we are? These, these are interventions that we want to see have an impact on a, an ongoing basis to start making an impact as much as possible. They are not starting right now, as I reflected earlier on. There has been work underway for some considerable time to reduce delayed discharge. It, Hamza made this point earlier on. It's one, I think, that often gets lost when people look at the overall number of delayed discharges and think that's static. It's not. It's, you know, people uh, get discharged from hospital, other people come into hospital. What we are seeking to do is lower that number in, in absolute terms. Uh, there has been a reduction in recent weeks, so... Uh, already there is progress, but we need to see uh, more. So these are interventions uh, that we want to have an ongoing basis. The, the headline statistics on any aspect of health and social care uh, will always mask uh, different changes uh, underneath the headlines, but this is about freeing up capacity in our hospitals um, as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, Sev Carell from The Guardian. Um, can I just go back to this question of the strikes and the talks of the RCM and the RCN? 
Are you saying to them, are you saying to the public, are you saying to all the people in the health service that the current paying conditions offer you have in front of them is fixed? There is no room for manoeuvre on that at all this year? We have no more money this year, and we said that all along. We maximised. I sat in another room in this building uh, with health service unions uh, before the, uh, the the latest final uh, offer was made, and and was very frank with them. We weren't holding anything back. We were putting everything on the table. Um, and so I, I think if you were speaking to all of the health unions, while they would want to see more money, they would recognise that we have been very clear with them about that. Uh, clearly, there are other, other discussions. We are already uh, rapidly getting to the point where we will be moving into next year's pay negotiations. So you know, clearly, that's part of the discussion we're having uh, with health unions. There are other issues uh, that are very uh, valid and relevant that are, uh, aside from headline pay increases uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, the, the structure of Agenda for Change in the NHS and, and the terms and conditions. So we remain actively engage, uh, engaged with unions um, and that will continue. Uh, I consider it, uh, and I, I'm not being in any way complacent about this, I think this will be a very, very hard thing uh, to achieve, but I am very, very clear about the priority I attach to avoiding industrial action in our National Health Service. First and foremost, because I don't think that's in the interests of patients or staff, but also because I value the work that our National Health Service staff do, and I don't want any uh, member of the NHS workforce feeling that their only option is to take industrial action, which is why we have uh, sought and uh, strived so hard to avoid it so far and will continue to do so. Tom Eden from the Daily Mail. Thank you, First Minister. It's a direct follow-up to that, really. Um, it was, if there is no more money, does that make more less strike action more more likely? What is your contingency plans if any industrial action does go ahead, and what impact will it have on the health service and patients' lives? Look, we'll, we'll continue to talk to unions. This year's pay deal um, has has been, you know, that offer has been made. It has been accepted by unions. Uh, representing the majority of health service workers. But we recognise uh, the concerns of uh, unions that have not accepted it and of workers generally. And that's why we will continue to engage uh, with them fully. We always have contingency plans for uh, you know, developments like this, but my focus is on trying to avoid that uh, happening. And again, you know, there is no sense of complacency as I say this, but it is not an insignificant uh, factor that we so far have managed to avoid industrial action in the National Health Service, which is not the case in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And that, I think, is an indication of the approach we take to industrial relations and the value we attach to the NHS workforce. So that will continue to be of the utmost priority to me, to Hamza, to the government, uh, to avoid any industrial action in our National Health Service. Um, and you know, I can't guarantee we will succeed there, but it will not be for the want of effort and engagement and doing everything we possibly can. Rachel Watson from The Sun. Thank you, First Minister. I just want to go back to strikes and Tom's question on contingency plans. You've spoken a lot about the stress and the pressure that NHS is under at the moment. If these strikes do go ahead, can the NHS withstand the pressure at the moment? And also, we've heard a lot about um, fears about retention of staff and doctors not being able to turn up for work. Um, if these problems do continue in winters to come, how do you go about attracting more people into the NHS when they see this pressure, when they see the concerns over pay and conditions? Uh, thanks, Rachel. On uh, your, your first question about contingency planning for industrial action, let, let me stress, industrial action, uh, of course, would not be uh, welcome in a health service that is facing the pressures that it is currently facing. It would not be in the interests of, of patients, but I don't, I don't believe any uh, member of the health service staff wants to take industrial action. They're not doing this because uh, they want to. Um, so I, I appreciate and, and recognise the, the strength of feeling there. That's why we remain so focused on trying to avoid it. Um, and in saying the next bit, I'm not underplaying at all the concerns of the, the unions that have not uh, voted to accept uh, this year's pay offer. But of course, more than the, the unions that have accepted the pay offer represent more than half of the, uh, I think I'm right in that, yeah, more than are. half of the NHS workforce. So there's already a considerable part of the NHS workforce uh, for whom industrial action is not uh, on the table right now. But I want to see 
the prospect of industrial action uh, removed, uh, if at all possible, and will continue to engage fully to try uh, to achieve that. Um, I'll hand over to Hamza to say a bit more about future recruitment. We have uh, had strong recruitment into the NHS in recent years. That is uh, difficult at the moment, more difficult than it has been certainly in any previous year that I've been in government for a variety of reasons. You're right to point to the, the pressure and uh, the uh, the perception that that will give those thinking about healthcare as a profession and we need to, to work to address that. We have pension issues that are making it uh, more likely that doctors are leaving the profession and I would you know, urge the UK government to resolve those uh, as much as possible. And again, Brexit, whether we like it or not, whether people think this is me making a political statement, I'm not intending to. The hard fact is Brexit is making recruitment much, much more difficult. So these are issues that we're grappling with that we need to navigate our way through, but they are there um, and we can't pretend they're not. Yeah, thanks, uh, First Minister. And, and you're absolutely right to say that the, the, the majority of stack, the negotiating committee uh, for the Agenda for Change pay deal, the majority of trade unions on stack that represent the majority of unionised uh, members have accepted uh, the pay deal. But nonetheless, the conversations with those who rejected continue. I mean, it's fair to say that I've spoken to uh, some uh, trade union uh, leaders more than I think I've probably spoken to my mum over the festive period. So those conversations and continued dialogue, uh, that, 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 that meaningful dialogue will, will absolutely continue. Um, in, in terms of, I think it was a really good question around uh, workload and retention of the workforce. Uh, well, the immediate thing we can try to do is reduce the pressure on them. Uh, clearly going into a shift, whether you're a doctor or a nurse, and we heard this from Dr Lyle Peel uh, over the weekend, the deputy uh, chair of the, the, the BME, that we don't want them dreading going into their next shift. And clearly a number of our colleagues uh, are facing that uh, anxiety. So re reducing the pressure through the initiatives the First Minister has announced that we'll give further detail of uh, tomorrow will be part of that. Uh, we will recruit. Uh, there's three three-pronged strategy we have for that. One is the pipeline. So making sure that we continue to, to, to ensure for the workforce of the future we have enough graduates going in uh, to, to, to that pipeline. So we've committed, for example, to increase medical graduates by 100 uh, per year over the course of the parliamentary term and, and, and doing that. Domestic recruitment, and by that I mean uh, right across the entire United Kingdom. So we have a, a proactive campaign, for example, to recruit GPs from other parts of the UK to see if they'll come to work in, other, uh, in particularly remote rural areas uh, of, of Scotland. And then the international recruitment piece, which the First Minister has uh, spoken about. Uh, we've also taken measures to, to bolster retention. Uh, the BMA called for the introduction of a, a REC scheme, a recycling of employers contribution scheme. Uh, I announced that uh, we would devolve that power uh, to local, local health boards uh, to do that. Uh, and we've done things like, for example, uh, given a timetable for the implementation of safe staffing legislation, which is something the RCN have been calling for and welcomed the timetable uh, in, in, in that respect. So we'll continue to work with trade unions and professional bodies to see what more we can do on both recruitment and, crucially, retention too. OK, thanks. We're getting towards the end of my list, but I'm going to, uh, as I promised earlier on, take everybody who's indicated. Uh, I think we've got four uh, people left. Uh, Andy Phillip from the PNG is uh, next up. No, Andy's not here, sorry. Um, Abby Garton-Crosby from The National. Um, just a quick question for me, First Minister. Um, so you said about, you know, booking out care home beds and stuff. Do you have a kind of number in mind of how many you think you're going to need to book out? And do you think that there's capacity there in care homes to do that? Well, as I said earlier on, we're going to book as many uh, as we can. Obviously, many, most care home beds will already be in use, but we think there is some spare capacity there. We know there is some spare <coughs> capacity there. So we'll be working with health and social care partnerships to maximise that over uh, the immediate period. Uh, Dan Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thanks, First Minister. Um, yeah, just given the pressures on the NHS you've set out, I, I wonder if you would encourage wealthier people who can afford it to go private, if, if that's an option to them. Um, you know, could that be the socially responsible thing to do so that the capacity is there for those who you know, can't, don't have that option? Um, and also, can each of you tell us whether you personally use private health care? Thanks. Uh, well, firstly, no, I, I don't, um, and I, I never have. Um, no, I wouldn't encourage people to go private. People have the right to make that choice. My job as uh, First Minister is to work to ensure that we have a health service, uh, a health service, a publicly funded uh, health service available and free at the point of need for everybody uh, who needs it. And that is my focus. That is uh, particularly challenging right now for all the reasons we've been talking about. But my job, my duty, my responsibility is to focus on making sure uh, that that is what we are delivering. Hamza? Uh, no, I don't. Use private health care. Uh, so my family have. 
But, uh, but I think it's more complex than, I don't think it necessarily pays off in the way that people think, just to suggest that some people use private health care. It's often the same doctors working in different settings delivering that. So um, I think it's much better to work through the, the systems that have been outlined already. And lastly, Louise Wilson from Holyrood. Thanks, Mr. Minister. Um, I just had a quick question on vaccine take-up, given that you've said um, flu and COVID are some of the major pressures. Um, I was just looking at the statistics there, and the take-up for health and care staff is actually fairly low, lower than you'd maybe want them to be. So what are you doing to encourage those staff to get more? And I also wondered whether you'd considered um, extending the uh, eligibility for vaccines to make sure that the protection is wider across the population. Well, th thanks, Louise. Three quick points from me on that, and then I'll see if Hamza and Graham have anything they want to add. Uh, finally, uh, firstly, uh, eligibility. Uh, we are guided in our decisions by uh, JCVI advice, and uh, that will continue to be the case. So the eligibility at the moment is as advised and recommended uh, by the experts who have that task. Uh, secondly, uptake overall for uh, COVID and flu vaccines this winter is is high and good, and you know that's credit to those coming forward, uh, but also to uh, the very many uh, staff who are delivering these vaccine programmes. Um, but thirdly and lastly, yes, of course, we want to encourage more health and care staff to come forward for vaccination. I appreciate that, given the pressures we've been talking about today, that is perhaps something that health and care staff have, you know, perhaps felt they hadn't had time to do. But I would encourage, and you know, one of the uh, things that we discuss on an ongoing basis is how we uh, advertise and promote vaccine uptake to the population generally who are eligible, but to particular groups where we want to encourage higher uptake. Um, so that will continue. Graham, any points you want to make by? Um, just very quickly, the best way you can protect yourself is to get vaccinated. So if you're still eligible and you haven't had a vaccine, please do come forward for both, where possible, the COVID and flu vaccine. Both are well uh, known to be safe and effective, so it's the best way you can protect yourself. And Hamza, any final point? Oh, you're absolutely right in your uh, examination of the figures. Uh, health and social care uh, workers' uptake is lower than we'd want it to be and lower than previous iterations of the programme. Um, so we've done a number of things. Uh, one is trying to make sure we take the vaccination to them, to workers in, their, in, in, in situ, whether that's uh, in hospitals, community settings, or indeed in, in, in care homes. Uh, the second thing I've asked is, uh, and we've done this over the, over, before the festive period, of course, is to get uh, uh, do some more marketing with clinicians, speaking to other clinicians. Uh, so getting the likes of the National Clinical Director, the CMO and others uh, to speak to those, uh, the DCMO, uh, forgive me, it was to speak to uh, those clinical staff to encourage uh, uptake. And the third thing is working directly with the likes of Scottish Care, uh, Donald McCaskill and, and others, uh, to ensure that, uh, again, uh, the message is spreading through their networks, through care home providers, care at home providers, to just stress the importance uh, of the, 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 the vaccine. Uh, so, so a number of actions, and they'll continue, uh, I should say, as the, the weeks and months uh, go on. Okay, thank you. Uh, that concludes the questions today. Can I thank you all for attending and for uh, your patience? Uh, I know these sessions have gone for a while, but that is a